Good morning and welcome once again to Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church's virtual worship. I hope that you are uh, watching us via Facebook Live or YouTube. We're glad that you have joined us. I hope this doesn't last very long, but news is indicating indicated that we might be uh, doing this a bit longer. So we encourage you to stay tuned in. Please hit subscribe or like. Uh, if you're on Facebook, there are a uh, chat section. Uh, please uh, sign in. Let us know that you're worshiping with us uh, from where you're located as you're worshiping. And you can offer your prayer requests if you don't mind them uh, being shared publicly because we want to pray with and for you. As we prepare our hearts for worship, let's uh, focus on the book of Lamentations. And certainly we have been lamenting and grieving over uh, a tremendous amount of loss that we have all experienced. But listen to what Lamentations 3, 23 and 22 and 23 says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Friends, as we worship the Lord, let's put our hope and our trust in our great God. Join me in this call to worship that invites us to celebrate the steadfast love and faithfulness of our God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Sing to him with joyful songs. Tell of his wonderful deeds among the nations. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. We rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us. Let's pray. Father, this morning, would you draw our hope to you, to your steadfast love and faithfulness, a love that raises the dead. Bring our fears and our doubts, our concerns and our confusion, to the beauty and power of what you have done, what you have given in your Son, Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Let's sing together. So the good news that God, is that God has revealed his holy name in Jesus, which means that we, an unholy people, can come to him and can confess our sins. We can confess our unholiness and know that we will be forgiven. We will be shown mercy and we will be made new through the power of Jesus overcoming sin and death. So trusting in that, would you join me now as we pray and confess our sins together? Almighty God, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and to humbly confess to you our unbelief. While we know and believe that Jesus died for us on the cross and that he was raised for us from the dead, we admit it often makes too little difference in our lives. Forgive us, we pray. Enable us to fully embrace the truth of the gospel, that our love for you may flourish that our obedience may be wholehearted and joyful, and that our witness may be more courageous. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and triumphant Lord. Amen. Continue to seek God's mercy as we spend a few moments.
Now lift up your heads and hear the good news of the power that overcomes your sin. This is from 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let's sing together and celebrate that truth. And we appreciate the financial support that you have been providing Walnut Creek. We are stable, and that is very helpful financially. You can continue to give online, and there is a link uh, provided to you. You can also go to wcpc.org. Uh, for online giving, as well as keeping updated with all of the ministries um, and small groups that are happening. Yes, it is via Zoom, uh, but we have things for men and women and children, and you are welcome to go there and find where you can uh, virtually get plugged in uh, to Walnut Creek. Our leadership will be meeting this week as we start looking forward to a re-entry plan. In the state of Ohio, we're not sure exactly when that will be, uh, but nevertheless, we want to let you know that we are thinking ahead, and our concern is for everyone's health and well-being. Uh, At the same time, uh, we can't wait to uh, meet together and to be together as the Walnut Creek family. So uh, stay tuned for upcoming news on our phases of re-entry that will will happen. We have been studying the uh, book of Acts, and uh, we have been learning what it means to become missionaries in our changing culture. As we trace the missionaries, uh, uh, missionary journeys of of Paul and his companion Luke and others, uh, what we're doing is seeing how they went to new cities and new towns and new countries and new cultures sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And we are learning how we can share the same good news of Jesus Christ to the ever-changing culture around us. Today our focus is Acts 17. Follow along as I read. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Eustace, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack or harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And Paul stayed for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, 
this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, uh, uh, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O oh Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to this. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sencrea, he had, his, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left Priscilla and Aquila there, but he himself went to the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, if, if, um, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. When he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then went down to Antioch. After spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. A coaching tree is similar to a family tree in that it shows the relationship of coaches instead of family members. Coaching trees are common in the National Football League, and most of the coaches in the NFL can trace their lineage back to a certain head coach to whom they previously worked for as an assistant. For example, in 1998, half of the active NFL head coaches could be traced to either Bill Walsh or Tom Landry. They either had been an assistant coach under Bill Walsh in San Francisco or Tom Landry in Dallas. 20 years later, in 2018, an ESPN article showed visually that 28 of the 32 head coaches in the NFL were connected to three coaches, either Bill Parcells, Marty Schottenheimer, or Bill Belichick. In Acts 17, we get a glimpse of Paul's coaching tree. Notice the folks mentioned in this chapter. Aquila and Priscilla, Silas and Timothy and Apollos. And we already know that folks like Luke and Barnabas and Mark have worked alongside Paul and they worked alongside each other. It's as if Paul were the head coach and he's training these assistants and then they go out to different cities like Antioch and Ephesus and, and to the region of Galatia and they begin to start churches and training people. And so it goes on. And so in this, we get a, a clue of Paul's coaching philosophy. He actually tells Timothy this in his second letter to 2 Timothy 2.2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. We see this very dynamic happening in Acts 17. Paul mentored Priscilla and Aquila, who in turn mentored Apollos, who many scholars believe wrote the New Testament book of Hebrews. 
Paul isn't unique, though, in having a coaching tree in ministry. Jesus himself had a coaching tree. Eleven faithful disciples. Eleven assistant coaches mentored by Jesus. And after Jesus' uh, uh, ascension, these disciples, who became known as apostles, continued to testify to Jesus' life and death and resurrection while mentoring others to do the same. It's interesting, if we look at church history, we see that Jesus mentored John. And then through the annals of church history, we see that John had a coaching tree, and we can trace his discipleship or mentoring relationships, because John mentored Polycarp, who was the bishop of Smyrna, and Ignatius, the bishop of Antioch. Polycarp would go on to disciple Irenaeus, who wrote a great book called Against Heresies. And Irenaeus, excuse me, that's how you should pronounce it. Irenaeus would go on to disciple uh, Hippolytus, who was one of the most important and influential theologians pre-Constantine. Paul had a coaching tree. Jesus had a coaching tree. And this is where it's going to get fun. Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church has a coaching tree. Folks who have worshipped and learned and served and worked here have gone out to other states and cities and countries and churches impacting others with the gospel. Walnut Creek has a gospel legacy that has interconnecting tendrils stretching far and wide. And so let me tell you a few stories about Walnut Creek's coaching tree. This is going to be fun. I think of Patterson and Sharon Hicks, a young couple just starting to have kids and getting settled in their career, and Sharon would play the piano on our worship team, and eventually they were with us for a few years and, and, and moved on to China, and then to Singapore, where Patterson's business took him there, but they also did missionary work in China and Singapore with, uh, with schools and orphanages. Sharon became part of Paracaleo's staff, Paracaleo, a ministry that coaches and mentors uh, church planning spouses. Now, Sharon has a, a counseling um, practice, uh, continues to train and support Paracaleo, and Patterson is now serving on Paracaleo's board. They've gone far, they've gone wide, they've been interconnected, and they started much of their ministry and learning about the gospel and its impact to the heart in everyday life here at Walnut Creek. And then there's our dear friend Todd Nail. He pastored with us for quite a while, was our first youth pastor and church planting apprentice. And then he left here and went to Granville, where he planted the Granville Chapel. While Todd and Lori were there planting that church, they had a Denison student join them, and his name was John Downs. And then John, eventually, after he graduated from Denison, after being a member at the Granville Chapel, which Todd planted, you see how this is going, he came here and became Walnut Creek's youth pastor. Right now, John has made his, and Lindsay have made his way down to University Presbyterian Church in Oviedo, Florida, where is the, he's the youth pastor. Now, here's where it gets really cool. When Steve and Tammy were thinking about going to seminary, uh, a member of our small group at the time at Purdue University said, oh, if you're thinking about going to Reformed Theological Seminary, my sister and her husband live there, so when you go check out the seminary, they will house you. So we went down there on a scouting trip for seminary, and Tricia and Mark Bates uh, housed us and sh gave us a layout of the land. When we ended up going to RTS Orlando, living in Orlando, uh, Florida, we became members of Orangewood Presbyterian Church, and I took over in an interim youth position because Mark Bates, our host, 
started to plant University Presbyterian Church. As he's planting that church, a young high schooler went to that church and found Jesus. And his name is James Kessler, who's planting a church in Hilliard, which Walnut Creek has supported their plant, and next week is about to be particularized and organized as a full-fledged congregation. Can you see how this is all working together? And this is what the good news of Jesus Christ does as it joins hearts and families and its tendrils go all over the world and are interconnected because we are sharing the same work of God in the hearts of people through the grace and the forgiveness that Jesus offers on the cross. And then there's Justin and Amy Grimm. Tammy and I are down in Atlanta. We are assessing, oh, uh, it was about 14 couples to uh, uh, discern their fitness for church planting. And, and we ran into one couple that we really took a shining to and liked, and that was Justin and Amy. So after the assessment, because we're not allowed to recruit while we're assessing, but as soon as they were assessed, we said, let's go across the street to the restaurant. Uh, God loves you, and Tammy and I have a wonderful plan for your life. And we said, we would love for you to come to Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church and spend some time in a church planning apprenticeship. We need help with our youth uh, since John Downs had left and, and, and worship, and we'd love for you, Justin, to come. And so he did and was with us for a few years. And then in the la uh, a year and a half ago, we uh, sent them and, uh, to Westerville, the nearby suburb, to start Story. Presbyterian Church. And they took a great launch team of folks from Walnut Creek. They took Ken and Abby Hutto joined them. Abby, who was our current director of women's ministries, who was Paracaleo trained and, and mentored and, and is a trainer and teacher for Paracaleo, as well as uh, a, an author and speaker and starting her own ministry. Libby Oler, who was our director of children's ministry, uh, went with them. And then there was Kathy Monbeck, who also joined that team. Kathy Monbeck, who came to Walnut Creek's very first worship service and became a Christian, was with us for over 20 years, and now is helping spread the gospel to Westerville. There have been other folks that have been with us from day one. There are doctors Bill and Amy Lay, and they have been leading and serving for over 20 years uh, at Walnut Creek in countless capacities, as well as sharing Jesus with fellow doctors and their patients. Matt and Carol Geary have been with us from day one. Matt has been a ruling elder as well as Bill Lay, and, and Carol is now the director of our women's ministry. But let me tell you what else Matt and Carol do. Matt serves on the board of Grace Christian School, which many of our uh, students uh, here at Walnut Creek have either attended there or are students at that school right now. And Carol is a teacher there. And for nearly 15 years, they have had a great influence on students and teachers and families as they continue uh, through private education that's also scripture and, and gospel-based at Grace Christian School. And thinking of schools, I, I know of the teachers at Walnut Creek Presbyterian Church, and we have many of them. Some of them are homeschool teachers, some are private or Christian school teachers, some are public school teachers. But you teachers have a tremendous impact where you're at in the classroom and with parents and with families. I look about and know of the doctors and nurses and those in our congregation in the healthcare profession. We have IT specialists, we have college students, we have parents, we have grandparents, we have retired folks, and all of you in your place are having influence with your network, with your circle of relationships as you uh, share in word and deed the good news of Jesus. I'm reminded of, of Cliff Merritt, a retired gentleman here at Walnut Creek who goes weekly to uh, the county jail to share the gospel with those who are imprisoned. And everyone 
in many different ways at Walnut Creek is doing what Paul referred to in 2 Corinthians 2 as spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus everywhere. Sounds intimidating. Oh, how to become a missionary in our changing culture. My friends, it's as easy as spreading the fragrance of Jesus everywhere. Let me read that passage uh, extended in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. Paul says this, But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Jesus everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. My friends, wherever a Christian goes, wherever a believer in Jesus is, Paul describes them as a fragrance, the aroma of Christ. Let me tell you one more story. Let me tell you the story of one of Walnut Creek's sweetest smelling fruit from our tree, and that's Pericaleo. It's a ministry that started uh, 14 years ago to take the gospel to the hearts of women, particularly church planning spouses. And, and it was started by Tammy Resch, my wife, and Sherry Thomas, a church planter uh, in, in New York City. They co-founded this ministry, and as I got their annual report last week, let me tell you about their coaching tree. Right now, as of today, they have 47 trained and certified leaders. They have 38 current leaders in training. So this is Tammy and Sherry and, and their likes have, have trained 47 fo uh, ladies to continue to mentor other women in their church and in their city and in their network and denomination to take the hope of the gospel to their hearts. 38 women right now are being trained to do that in 11 countries where Pericaleo is present. And in those 11 countries and in, with those leaders, there are eight different languages spoken. You can see how the roots of their tree and the leaves and the branches are going deep and wide as Pericaleo has a tremendous coaching tree. And while Walnut Creek can't take credit for all the amazing work that Pericaleo has done and continues to do, 